Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to What's Growing On. And I am with um, our fabulous co-host and really the expert here, uh, Tarrant Lanier with Victory Teaching Farm down here in Mobile. Good morning, Tarrant. Good morning. How is your summer so far? It's it's going great. Going good, great. Good. Awesome. Awesome. So if we can get rid this rain out of here, it'd be even better. Um, so tomatoes today, it, <laughs> that, oh, good, good. I was going to ask, are the, are the tomatoes liking all the rain? And that's exactly what we're talking about today is um, tomatoes, different kinds, um, you know, different different uh, problems if, and fixes to those problems and all sorts of things. So, um, Taryn, I think we're going to start with the history of the tomato, which is pretty interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of the tomato? Yeah, so what I thought was super interesting is that at one point in time, tomatoes were thought to be poisonous. Um, so they origina originated around or were discovered around 700 <laughs> AD um, by, by the early Aztecs. And so um, it is believed that they are native to the Americas um, and they grew wild and they can still be found growing wild in the Andes Mountains. But the reason that they were thought at one point in time to be poisonous is there's two there's two kind of um, thoughts about that. And one is that they're part of the nightshade family. And at one point in time, particular nightshades and some still are were considered um, poisonous. And there was one particular that folklore has it. It was called the wolf peach that resembled a tomato. But supposedly they were poisonous and they were used um, to um, ward off or attract werewolves, depending on what you need <laughs> the werewolf for. And so hence the name Wolf Peach. And so um, eventually botanists, um, you know, elaborated on that and, and changed the scientific name and uh, of course discovered that the tomatoes weren't poisonous themselves. Another, um, Another um, um, historical um, thing about tomatoes is that the other reason they were thought to be poisonous is that um, wealthier people ate off of pewter and used pewter utensils, which are full of lead. And so the acid in the tomatoes would cause the lead to leach out um, and then people were consuming this lead um, and being poisoned, but they didn't attribute it to the pewter that they were using to eat off of. They attributed <laughs> it to the actual fruit. Um, poorer oh. people ate off of wood, and so they didn't necessarily have that problem. Um, and eventually, tomatoes um, made their way to Europe, and then, and then, uh, whenever um, they really became popular when um, there was a mass exodus of you know, Europeans and Italians to um, the United States and they brought them with them and they also brought with them pizza and things like that. Mm -hmm. Which of course we know tomato was a big part of pizza and pizza sauce. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I thought that was very interesting that at one point in time they were considered um, poisonous. Yeah, that really is. I um, And I'm so glad they're not because I could <laughs> take a pack of cherry tomatoes and eat the whole thing like potato chips. So oh, yeah. uh, and, and they're also extremely fun to grow, especially, you know, down here in the south because they're they're fairly easy to grow. So um, but that's just fascinating. I had heard that, too, that they had been they were considered poisonous. So, I, you know, I always wonder who was the one kind of like who was the first person to try the the first oyster it's like who is the first person to try a tomato th thinking they were poisonous or maybe they just didn't know <laughs> right so but that's fascinating so speaking of cherry tomatoes we're going to talk about uh next uh some of the popular varieties of cherry tomatoes or uh, tomatoes in general today so tell us a little bit about these yeah so these are the ones typically you can easily find seeds for in your local garden centers um, you can find already, you know, um, ready to go in the ground transplants. And um, again, these are typically the ones that you see the most often. Um, cherry tomatoes and then the Sweet 100, which is also a variety of cherry tomato, grow very, very well um, in South Alabama. And um, I'm assuming, you know, all across the state, they um, handle heat a little bit better. 
and the more you pick, the more the produce. Your big beef, your better boy, your celebrity, those are your big slicer tomatoes that you would, you know, slice up to put on a sandwich mm -hmm. or chop up to put in a salad or something like that. Um, and those typically are very easy to find. And then your Roma tomatoes, um, which those tomatoes <laughs> are um, one of my favorites because they are the best for making pico de gallo or um, canning. They're a very good mm -hmm. tomato for canning um, because they, um, they're what's called a determinant. And we'll talk about that too, but they um, produce very heavily all at once. So if you're looking to can, you you, you'll have your 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 stock right there all kind of all at once. Awesome. Awesome. And like you were saying, the the big beef and the better boy, those are always good on those classic southern tomato mayonnaise sandwiches, you know, and um, I think we can all agree that those type of tomatoes are perfect. You know, it's it's always a debate on which mayonnaise you use. And if you're a true southerner, if you use a certain type of mayonnaise or not. So um, but yeah, those are those are definitely, definitely good. Um, Tomato pie as well. That yes. is my favorite things to do with those big slicer tomatoes. Is yes. Tomato, tomato pie. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's lots of ooey gooey cheese and tomatoes and basil. And it literally is a pie and a pie crust. Although don't make the mistake I did. The first time I ever made a tomato pie, I didn't even think twice about it. And I bought a graham cracker crust. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> didn't make it from scratch. But um, yeah, so it, it, my husband said, why does it taste so sweet. And then I realized what I had done. So definitely get just your standard pie crust. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't the way it was supposed to be. But yeah, tomato pie. Um, Google that or, or research that for a recipe and definitely yeah. try it. I am going to do that because that sounds delicious. And before we move on, uh, Sheila Johnson Morris says she's watching. Good morning, Sheila. Thanks for watching. And then Candy Williams says, good morning. Now I'm cre craving a tomato sandwich. Me too, Candy. Sorry, that was my fault. But I just I saw those tomatoes and I was like, ooh, you know, it would be good. So that might be lunch today. So all right. So moving on, we're going to talk about some more um, varieties, but maybe some that we don't find that often. So tell us a little bit about these fun ones. Right. So and we have <clears throat> grown all of these um, at Virtue Teaching Farm and I have grown some of these and currently growing um, in my home garden. Now, these typically now your Cherokee purple, you can sometimes find those transplants at your uh, mm -hmm. local garden center. And a lot of times you can find the seeds. Um, but most of these literally it's easier just to um go online and order them from, you know, a you know, one of your favorite seed companies, um, which there are plenty of them. But um, the Cherokee Purple and um, the Green Zebra, the Black Crim, the Tiger, Tigerella, the Sun Gold. Mm -hmm. um, Sun Gold's a little bit smaller as well as the Tigerella, but the Black Crim, the Cherokee Purple, those are kind of your bigger slicer tomatoes. And they these the thing about these tomatoes is they just have such beautiful coloring. They're gorgeous. Um, if you notice in the pictures and mm -hmm. um, the Brad's Atomic, that's more of a it's not a cherry tomato. It's not. a it, it, it looks like a mini Roma tomato in its size, but it's about the size of a cherry tomato. And they are absolutely beautiful. They are black and purple and green kind of. Um, just kind of all mixed together and they are just they're, they're the prettiest tomatoes and what's great about these tomatoes is they all have a different taste that isn't your typical just standard tomato taste like the Cherokee mm -hmm. purple is super sweet um the Brad's Atomic to me were very sweet um and so but these are really cool varieties to grow um and like I said sometimes you can find them in your garden center um in the seed section um, sometimes you can find um, the Cherokee purple already in a transplant form, but um, your best luck. And this is just a small, um, a small list of, of yeah. unique varieties. But your, your seed companies have just an endless, endless um, list of really unique tomatoes to grow. And many times the seed companies also will tell you exactly what growing conditions they like, which I think most tomatoes grow very well um, in Alabama and South Alabama anyway. So, mm -hmm. 
Awesome, awesome. And just to look at these pictures, the one um, to our left is the Cherokee purple, and then the, the green zebras in the middle there, and then the, on the one on the other side is the tigerella, and they're just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Now, are the the, th the ones like the green zebra, are those ones that you can make like fried green tomatoes out of? You certainly can. Awesome, awesome. And Candy, uh, sorry, I know now you might be craving fried green tomatoes like I am, just like that tomato <laughs> sandwich. So awesome. And we actually had a question that is going to bring us right into our next um, next discussion, which is heirloom versus hybrid. So tell us a little bit about this. This is something that I've always been interested in learning more about. Right. So heirloom <laughs> tomatoes and heirloom basically describes, you know, they are typically passed down from generation to generation from different regions. They're usually 40 plus years older um, and they're <laughs> open pollinated. Um, so I would assume the first tomatoes that we were talking about that grew wild, they would be mm -hmm. considered heirloom tomatoes. They're open pollinated by insects or the wind. Um, and they're very, um, they're more prone to diseases um, unlike hybrids. And um, heirlooms produce a variety of sizes and fruit, and they're less uniform in production because they've not been altered in any particular way um, by humans. Awesome. And so then you have hybrids. So hybrids <laughs> are created when breeders will intentionally cross pollinate two varieties um, that produce an offspring, offspring that has the best trait of each parent, which would mean, you know, one particular variety may be bigger and one may be more disease resistant. So they wanted a bigger, more disease resistant um, variety. And so they cross pollinate the two. Um, most hybrid seeds are sterile and they won't necessarily germinate. And um, but sometimes they will, but you don't know necessarily what you're going to get because you're going to get one of the parent plants or maybe some kind of different variety. So um, if they do germinate, um, you're definitely not probably going to get exactly what it was that you started off with. Um, but they are more disease resistant. Um, you can test their germination by taking the seeds and putting them in a wet napkin. Um, and kind of keeping them moist for a couple of days. And if they sprout, then um, you know that you have one that germinated. And it may have just been it had a stronger um, a stronger uh, portion of one particular parent plant than the other. Um, and then hybrids are typically what you see in the supermarket because they have mm -hmm. been um, they have been um, changed to be a particular way. And so you would notice these, they, they're all uniform. They're all about the same, same shape. They're all the same color. Um, and so typically what you see in the supermarket is hybrid and, unless they're labeled as an heirloom. Excellent, excellent. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Thank you for that. So next we're gonna talk about the difference between determinate versus indeterminate. And you touched on this a little bit in the beginning, but can you go further into detail on this? Yeah, so determinate um, are a mass one time bloom and produce. And so, like I said, aroma is a determinant. And typically when you're purchasing um, either your transplants already ready to go in the ground or your seeds, it's going to tell you on there whether or not it's a determinant or an indeterminate. Um, but basically they bloom all at once, set their fruit, and they can be har harvested for mass production. Um, indeterminate um, will constantly produce. So um, think cherry tomatoes or sweet 100s. The more mm -hmm. you pick them, the more they bloom, the more they produce. Um, indeterminates will grow wild. I mean, they can become out of control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they just, and a lot, a lot of times determinates are more of a bush type variety. Um, but your indeterminates, <laughs> those are the ones you really got to keep on top of um, with either your tomato cages or your, um, your, you know, time, tying them up or your steaks or things like that, because they'll just keep growing and going crazy as long as you let them. <laughs> so I, I didn't realize that, but the cages are actually to keep them contained. So yes, it does help keep them contained. Yeah. And it helps keep them, keep their leaves and the fruit off of the ground, okay. um, which, um, mm -hmm. You know, when when that happens, you, you're more prone to pests and diseases. 
Right. And speaking of pests and diseases, we're going to be talking about uh, problems and fixes to those problems. And then actually, we're going to pick, post these pictures up. But we did have a quick question um, from Ann Hales. She says, my tomato plants are losing the flower, so I don't have many tomatoes. Any ideas? OK, Ann. So great question. And it led us right into our next um, <laughs> topic. And um, it sounds to me what you have is that middle picture called Blossom Drop. Um, and then we'll just kind of hit on. There, these are kind of your main problems associated with tomatoes. Blossom in rot. And this is actually it says blossom in rot, but this is actually your tomato um, starts to rot and, um, at the end where the blossom was. Um, your blossom drop where, like Ann says, she's losing her flowers, so she's not really getting any tomatoes. Uh, cracked tomatoes, um, this can sometimes be a big problem. We actually lost an entire crop of tomatoes one year at the farm because of this particular um, issue, which unfortunately um, was out of our control at this point in time, and we'll talk about why. Then you have blight, and this is where your leaves start to get spots and turn yellow and brown, and just it seems like your plant's just withering up um, and dying. And then, of course, pests. You know, we hate to see those holes in our tomatoes because we know that there's something that's gotten in there and um, pretty much can turn your, your tomato into, you know, something that's not edible. Mm -hmm. So, and also we have a, another question and I'm just going to hit on this one real yeah, quick. Yeah, please do. I was just reading that. Yeah, because it, it follow it, it follows all of this. Um, Northwest Florida, does it get too hot for tomatoes to set fruit? So we're going <laughs> to answer that question next, Ms. Morris, and um, as, as well as Ann's question. So here we go. There we go. Okay. So these are kind of the common problems that we just talked about and looked at what these look like for our tomatoes. So the blossom in rot, that is typically a lack of calcium in your soil. Um, I'm all about composting and using natural methods. Um, eggshells naturally add calcium to your soil. Um, so, you know, this is a great um, additive to, to put around the bottoms of your, um, of your tomato plants to add calcium. But a lot of times, if this doesn't fix it, you, there are over-the-counter, I say over-the-counter, off-the-shelf products at your local garden center that are, are fertilizers. I encourage people to go with the all-natural uh, fertilizers if you can. And um, sometimes you need to do a soil test just to, to determine, you know, what is lacking in your soil to see what you need to add. And those soil tests are easy. You get them at your local garden center. They're very user friendly, you know, very easy to use yourself. So then, okay, and this one is um, related to um, what you're asking and also Miss Morris as well. So blossom drop. So tomatoes have to have certain temperatures um, to continue to retain their blooms and create fruit. So when our night temperatures, which can happen here very early in the year, or it can, you know, like we've had some pretty cool temperatures for, you know, May and June, um, cold fronts and things like that have come through. But when your night temperatures exceed what is tolerable for the tomatoes, to, they will no longer retain their blooms and they'll start to drop their blooms, which means no fruit for you. The ideal temperature for tomatoes is between 55 and 75 um, at nighttime. You can't change the weather, obviously, but you can plan accordingly based on your region's typical weather patterns. So, um, you know, we typically, because it seems to get hotter here sooner um, than it does, you know, for our northern neighbors, um, you know, we plant tomatoes earlier in the year. Um, sometimes, February, you know, when we think that last frost, which you never know, we can get a frost mm -hmm. in May sometimes, but you just, you know, again, you can't really predict the weather, but you can at least kind of have a good idea of what your typical pattern is and kind of base when you plant, um, you know, your, your crops on that. And with tomatoes, you can look at, you know, how long, you know, 60 to 90 days from seed to fruit and kind of determine, okay, when does it start getting, you know, above 75 degrees at night in my area and kind of backtrack to when you would need to get those tomatoes in the ground to make sure that 
they're producing fruit before it gets too hot. Now, I, going back to their question, um, you know, they're, if the nighttime temperatures that they're, you know, experience blossom drop like like Anne is, um, will will her tomatoes come back? Like, will they rebound and produce more blossoms at this time, or is it a little too late? Or so you can continue to take care of them and nurture them over the course of the summer. Um, you know, it depends on how hot it gets to whether or not, you, you know, your plant mm -hmm. burns up. I mean, if it's in full sun and we've got, you know, mm -hmm. several weeks of just nothing but 100 degree temperatures, you know, it may even burn the plants up. But if you can mm -hmm. keep your plants or if you can bring your plants into um, a cooler area <laughs> in your yard, maybe that's half shade or something like that. Um, if you can get them to hang on till fall time, you can have what they call a bumper crop. Um, and have fall tomatoes. Okay, great. That's good information to know. All right, moving on. Cracks in fruit. Yeah, so this is what happened to us at the farm. We had tomatoes everywhere and they were beautiful. And then we had one of those typical summer patterns where it rained every single day for like two weeks. And I'm not talking about just a, a quick little, you know, summertime shower and then the mm -hmm. sun comes back out. I'm talking about excessive rain, excessive downpours, flooded raised beds. Um, and so what happens is, is the fruit consume that water. And when there's too much water, it basically fills the fruit so much because, you know, what, you know, tomatoes are a juicy, a juicy, you know, vegetable. Mm -hmm. fruit. Um, and so, when this happens, um, they consume all of this water and it causes the, the, the fruit to crack and split um, because of too much water. One thing you can do, which at the farm, we try to always rely on nature um, because the best, you know, the best water for plants is, you know, that from mother nature, you know, cause you don't get all of the chlorine and the different chemicals when you're watering with, you know, um, you know, city water or well water, things like that. But, um, not well water, city water, um, or like irrigation, you know, systems. But um, you can in your home gardens, just make sure that you water them consistently throughout the season, um, maybe every other day, but, um, you know, just so they kind of maintain a balance. And so when it does, when we do have those excessive downpours, they're not sucking up as much water as they can get because they're already happy and they have kind of what they need. Um, so, you know, to try to avoid that, which again, you know, again, you can't change the weather, but to kind of water consistently throughout your season will help um, with that becoming an issue when we have you know, these weeks of nonstop rain. Okay. Next is blight. Yeah, so this typically is a fungus in your soil. <clears throat> and so it's always good to rotate your crops each year. Um, whether it's a tomato or, you know, a cabbage or whatever, um, it's it's good to change what you plant each year and change, you know, the space of, of which you put them in because certain plants are more prone to certain funguses and certain diseases. And a lot of times that becomes something that's in your soil. And if you have issues with tomatoes one year and then you plant tomatoes in that same space the next year, um, whatever that issue was, is just going to reattack your new plants. Um, so you definitely want to rotate your crops. Um, but typically blight is usually a fungus. Um, and really one of the only ways, again, rotating crops is a great, you know, thing to do. Um, but if consistently you have this problem, even with rotating your crops, um, you can resort to um, antifungal products from your local garden centers. And again, I always encourage to look for the most natural methods before you um, look at the, the chemical methods, because we've always used natural methods and they always seem to do the trick for us. And we've never had to resort even my home garden or at the teaching farm. We've never had to resort. And I don't know that we ever would. I think we might would rather lose crops than put poison on them. But, um, you know, that's that's just, you know, kind of our philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's products out there that are natural and then there's, you know, other products that, um, you can use, you know, to handle blight. Excellent. Awesome. Good to know. And then of course, this has always been my biggest issue when I try to grow tomatoes is, um, the pests, the little boogers. Oh yeah. So, um, 
Typically, the first things you're going to notice is that specifically, since we're talking about tomatoes, um, but this can happen with your peppers and um, any of your other you know, veggies that you've got in your garden, but you're going to see holes in your fruit, holes in your leaves, or leaves completely disappearing. And these little guys, um, speci specifically the tomato hornworm, can eat and eat and eat. And one day you'll have a luscious, full of leaves, you know, tomato plant. You'll go out the next morning and half of its leaves will be gone, eaten to the stem. Um, and so one thing that is really important is visit your garden every day. Take a look because it can happen overnight. So if you're kind of proactive and kind of always looking to make sure that you don't notice some leaves missing or holes in fruit, to make sure that you don't have pests before they get out of control and destroy your whole crop. Um, one thing to look for is if you see leaves that are missing, start kind of looking down around the plant and you'll see the worms droppings. <laughs> and where their droppings are, usually you can kind of start looking up and you typically can find the pest. Um, mm -hmm. You can remove them as you see them and just pull them off your plant and dispose of them however, you know, another space in your yard or, or however you would like to dispose of them. <laughs> um, but um, another good thing to remember, and we talked about this with the cages and the stakes and trellising, is to keep your plants off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this, you know, deters, you know, that probability that pests are going to get on your plants as well as, um, you know, anything that might be in the soil um, that could cause, you know, disease. Um, companion plants, and we've always talked about this, companion mm -hmm. pants, plants are known for deterring pests. Um, and, and some that I think are really cool because you've kind of got um, your spaghetti already started. <laughs> yep. Tomatoes is thyme and basil and oregano. It is thought that the smell of these plants deters um, pests or masks the smell of the tomatoes, again, you know, deterring the pests from your plants. Again, mm -hmm. marigolds, we talk about marigolds all the time. Um, they're another one to plant and they're pretty to have in your garden. They add that splash of color and, you know, they're flowers. So they just, they make you happy anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, but lots of different herbs. These are not just the only ones. Um, barge is another one. Um, rosemary is supposed to look, work really well, um, but any of those strong smelling herbs, but I really like the tomato, I mean the thyme, basil, oregano, because like I said, you've got your kind of your, your spaghetti garden already going right there. Absolutely, and I was thinking, you know, with the basil, you've got your, a caprese salad halfway done, so yeah. that's my favorite. So, yeah. wow, that's really good information to know, um, and it's always a good reminder about companion plants because that's just so fascinating. So we have some quick comments. Um, one is, thank you for all this awesome info. That's from Teresa Wright. You are very, very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And Ms. Pat says hi. And if y'all remember, Miss Pat was on last episode. Her beautiful garden was featured um, with Panaia Farms. So, um, you know, uh, we want to thank her so much for coming. And um, <laughs> excuse me, guys. Let's see. Is uh, Bill Hawkins asked, is there any better companion plant for tomatoes? Is one better than the other or is just the whole spaghetti spice thing good? I mean, honestly, I feel like the whole spaghetti spice thing is great. Um, and, and that's what I typically go to. I mean, you know, gardening is trial and error anyway. I mean, there's so many different, um, um, you know, aspects of it. And there's so many different environmental, you know, issues or, you know, impacts. So it, it's where you're, you know, how your garden is laid out, you know, how much sun you're getting. I mean, it's just, you know, it is trial and error. Um, but I've always found that, you know, typically any kind of strong smelling herb, um, as well as the marigolds always work. Those are my go-tos. Those were our go-tos at the farm. Those are my go-tos at home. Um, and again, um, you know, I always encourage, you know, um, organic and sustainable and, and keeping your soil healthy. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, sometimes you do have to resort if you feel like the things that you're trying to do aren't working. And, you know, you don't ever want to lose, you know, a crop of um, fruits and veggies that you've worked so hard and nurtured 
So there are always, you know, alternatives. If, you know, you feel like what you're doing naturally is not working. Again, there are tons of natural products in your local garden centers um, that you can use to fertilize, to, you know, ward off pests and fungus and things like that. And so I always encourage people to look for those first. And they are right there where all the others are. Um, but I always encourage people if, if the natural, you know, sustainable method isn't working for you, um, that you can always, you know, explore those other options with your local garden center. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tarrant. We really appreciate it. This has been really fascinating. And, you know, like I said, at, down here in the South, we are all about the tomatoes. So this is a great, great informational session. And uh, folks, we are going to be back on the 21st um, to talk about more about what's growing on. And then we're going to take uh, July off um, for uh, for just rest and regrouping. And we'll be back in August. But join us next time on the 21st at 10 a.m. That's Monday, the 21st at 10 a.m. Tarrant, as always, thank you so much, folks. I've got Tarrant's uh email address going on going down below the screen so you can email her with any of your gardening questions or any ideas on topics uh, for what's growing on we'd love to know um, what what you want to learn about so please let us know and um, until okay. next oh yes go ahead so I just wanted to point out so Pat um, Pat Smith which oh, we yeah. featured last you know last episode, um, of her beautiful garden, um, which I've seen some pictures lately of, of all of her harvest and you wouldn't believe the tomatoes that she's getting um, in just a few short weeks from, you know, green to, you know, tons of tomatoes. Um, but one thing she's pointing out here, and I think what she's saying is that sunflowers are also um, probably a good companion plant because of course they're probably attracting those um, beneficials that um, ward off those insects that are not beneficial mm -hmm. to our gardens. Um, and then of course, sunflowers. Who doesn't love sunflowers? I mean, they're beautiful, beautiful. So absolutely. Um, thank you for having that, Pat. We appreciate it. And then Panaia Farms, um, I wish I had a picture to show you guys, but they had, yes, okay, she's agreeing with me. I've got it. <laughs> Panaia Farms had a huge patch of sunflowers and um just within two weeks the entire patch is is bloomed and beautiful and you can look on their um facebook page panaia farms um p-a-n-g-i-a farms and you can see some pictures of their gorgeous sunflowers um and pat posts regularly too um you know she's here local too she's always open to answer <laughs> questions just like panaia farms is and show you their beautiful gardens um, she has a YouTube channel, Pat G. Smith. Um, and oh, actually, fabulous. last time, and I forgot about this, um, Pat wrote a cookbook. Oh, so, nice, Miss Pat. She does. She has a cookbook. So um, I think it's called Pumpkin's Country Cooking, I believe. But, um, but yeah, she's just doing all kinds of amazing things with her garden. And she is a wealth of knowledge, too. Um, you can always email me um, and I'll do my best to answer all of your questions. Um, but there's there's a lot of people in our community that um, have a wealth of knowledge as well. So um, and, and she is one of them and Panaia Farms is one of them as well. So I want to thank them again for agreeing to do our last episode because that was real fun. <laughs> that was a great episode. Thank you to, to Tarrant for the pictures and thank you to Pat and Panaia Farms for that. And, you know, folks, there are always great places around the whole state. Um, there's uh, Jones Valley, I believe, teaching farm in Birmingham area. And then there's Eat South in um, Montgomery, Montgomery area. So you can always check those out. And Miss Pat put the name of her, um, her uh, cookbook in the comments so y'all can check that out and folks again we just want to thank you so much we'll see you back on the 21st Tarrant as always thank you can't wait to the next episode and folks we will um, run our events video to show you what's going on this week and we'll see you on the 21st thank you bye